Hi, welcome to MMT Mondays on Real Progressives. I'm Jeff Ginter, your host. So tonight we're continuing part two of the panel discussion at uh, LBJ School of Public Affairs on New Deals. We're going to continue with the final presentations from David Adler and Robert Polin and Rui Tavares. We'll be back at the end. Bye bye. Um, thank you, Jamie, for inviting me. It's good, to, very good to be here. So I'm actually going to talk about some specifics of macro policy uh, in the United States. Um, and we actually have a, a reasonably good, in my opinion, <coughs> a reasonably good starting place for thinking about a Green New Deal macro policy for the moment based on what happened uh, with the uh, Obama stimulus program in 2009. Um, so the green investment program that was part of the Obama stimulus program um, was quite substantial uh, relative to anything that preceded it. I should just as declare an interest, I did play a small role in designing and implementing the program, so I have a soft spot for it, of course. Uh, I wrote a paper called Green Recovery in 2008 that then got um, into the discussion in the design, and then subsequently I was hired by the Energy Department uh, under Obama to help implement uh, the program. Um, okay, uh, first of all, the idea of using green investments as a, as a stimulus program, a counter-cyclical program, short-term macro policy is obviously not original. People have already mentioned the original uh, New Deal included the Civilian Conservation Corps as one of its components. Um, uh, that said, uh, the, the program in the uh, 2009 stimulus uh, was uh, targeted at $90 billion, so it was 12% uh, of the overall program, the $800 billion two-year stimulus program. Yes, the program was too small, uh, but nevertheless, within that framework, the, the role of the green investment features of the overall ARRA, the stimulus program, was quite substantial. It was 12% of the whole program. Um, it was a remarkable conceptual breakthrough, uh, given where debates had been, or not even debates, given where the hegemonic position had been, including in the New York Times and polls and so forth, because the way discussions were uh, going, still are dominated, uh, with respect to climate is, well, okay, we, we have a trade-off here. Um, you can either save the climate and uh, you know, invest in the environment, or uh, you can go for jobs and growth. Choose one, but you can't do both. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I could cite you poll after poll, after, and I'm not talking about Trump and Trump supporters, of course, that's their position, but poll after poll in the New York Times that posed the question that way. It, there wasn't like, oh, is there, is there an alternative way to think about it? No, we're thinking about massive trade-offs. So, the fact that the Obama, Obama stimulus program uh, was driven by the idea that investing in the green economy uh, could be also a counter-cyclical uh, stimulus program and a jobs program was actually quite remarkable given where uh, mainstream thinking was at that point. Um, now the program, uh, there, was, there was a lot of issues with it which I'm gonna get to in a second. But at the microeconomic level of actually implementing various features, the program was a success. Um, let me just give you a one obvious example, uh, which was the investments that went to retrofitting buildings to raise the energy efficiency levels of buildings. Uh, was, uh, it, that is, in my view, the single best way to lower emissions cheaply and quickly in the United States and basically everywhere in the world, which is to raise efficiency standards in buildings. Um, and that was done, and it was done uh, at large scale, and the evidence on job creation uh, uh, panned out. I know, I know for a fact, because I was working on it, and I had done the estimates as to how many jobs we thought could get created, and all those jobs were created. So the program worked very well. The retrofitting program also uh, illustrated a, a critical component, and we can talk about various issues in financing, but I want to uh, feature one part of the financing uh, package, which is over time, the, the green investment project pays for itself. 
it is over time, if we think about the energy efficiency investments, by definition, they're going to lower the cost of consuming energy. And so that all you need to think about is the upfront capital expenditures. And over time, if we're running this building, for example, and you save 30, 40 percent on energy, and you borrow the money to undertake the initial capital expenditure, well, over whatever, 10 years, you can pay it back through your savings. Uh, that is a generalizable concept that will work within the Green New Deal. OK, so those are the good things. Let me just raise some issues that I think uh, were not uh, sufficiently thought through and which we can improve on as we build a macroeconomics of a Green New Deal. Uh, first of all, uh, the, obviously, the, the, this program under uh, Obama was created in a crisis, in a rush. And uh, the uh, question as to the proportions of public versus private investment were not thought through seriously. Or if they were thought through, uh, the uh, private interests uh, became dominant in determining where the money was going to go. Most of the funding was in the form of private inv investment incentives. So we, yeah, we say it's a $90 billion program, but the government was not putting up $90 billion. What it was doing was creating incentives to get private businesses to try to invest. And so thank you for mentioning my role as a, as a tiny green capitalist. That's really actually where I started my business idea, because I saw these investment incentives were there, and they weren't getting picked up. Now, of course they weren't getting picked up. You're in the middle of the Great Recession. And so, you know, to tell people, okay, in the and there, the, there are generous incentives there, but in the middle of a recession, it's not the kind of thing that a lot of people are going to take big risks to move into a new area of business activity. Um, and, it, it, you know, predictably, though we did get success at the micro level, at the macro level, you did not get adequate take-up rates. And so that really what you need, certainly at the, in the first phase of this kind of macro stimulus program, you need to lead with public investment, not private investment. Uh, the time dimension with respect to the investment activity was also not thought through clearly. If you remember, Obama uh, spoke very often about we're going after, quote, shovel-ready projects. Shovel-ready projects, that was the mantra. There's no such thing as a shovel-ready project. There was no such thing as a shovel-ready project. In fact, I just had a student uh, finish her dissertation whose conclusion was there's no such thing as a shovel-ready <laughs> project. And it's a very good dissertation. Thomas knows the student, uh, Thomas Herndon, another former student of mine, uh, knows the student who wrote it very well. Um, anyway, so the, it, if there's no such thing as a shovel-ready project, then, well, let's deal seriously with the time dimension. OK, the, the day after President Warren announces the program, how long is it going to take to actually get activity going? And you know, it depends on the type of projects. A retrofit project is not shovel-ready. It's not going to happen next week, but maybe in three or four months, you can get something rolling. Um, but um, you know, building, uh, put, putting solar panels on, on big rooftops is going to take a little longer. Uh, doing manufacturing um, in, in clean energy areas is going to take longer still. So we, we have to understand those if we're going to use this as a short-term stimulus macro policy as well as a long-term growth policy. Um, OK, uh, in terms of the uh, private incentives, um, the private incentives, uh, as I said, were, were very important. They were, they were the critical feature and the public investment component, the direct public investment, like, OK, money to, to retrofit this building, this public building, was inadequate. The pri that said, the, the private investment incentives actually yielded some uh, su significant successes on which I think we can build. And I will want to cite one case in particular. Uh, some of you may remember you know, the scandal around this uh, solar energy manufacturing company, Solyndra. Uh, the, the Solyndra company, which got a loan guarantee, $500 million, and then failed. And then, yes, the government was on the hook for the $500 million that uh, Solyndra had borrowed in order to start its manufacturing operations. What the, what the whole hubbub about the Solyndra case did not reveal, though, was that Solyndra was part of a, a broader loan guarantee program um, called Clean Energy 1705 Loan Guarantee Program. 
through which the government didn't just guarantee Solyndra, they guaranteed 24 projects for $14 billion. Now, of the 24 projects, 22 are still in operation. So this was a massive success. This was not a failure. Solyndra and one other company failed. Uh, over time, the net cost to the government through guaranteeing those loans was $300 million. So $300 million uh, and sent to help incentivize $14 billion in uh, clean energy investments, which is a leverage ratio of 50 to 1. Okay, one dollar of government expenditure to uh, underwrite these loan guarantees led to 50, uh, mil 50 billion in private investment. Now we can argue, okay, and it's uh, no doubt true that some significant percentage of those uh, uh, investments may have taken place even without the loan guarantee. We don't know what that percentage is. But uh, even if we knock off half of what I'm saying is the explicit uh, leverage ratio, 25 to one, that's still good. 10 to one, that's still good. Uh, so we have the opportunity uh, through uh, public-private partnerships, if uh, you said you weren't too down on them, uh, as, as, as one tool uh, to recognize the opportunities there that can emerge through using these kinds of programs. Now, again, the loan guarantee program was pretty good, uh, and you got $14 billion of investments, um, but you know, we, we were supposed to get $90 billion in total activity over the two years, and then it, it, it didn't actually pan out. Uh, and so by the time the Republicans took the Congress in 2010, by 2011, basically most of the features of the, of the green uh, part of the stimulus program were taken away. Um, okay, so uh, my overall point is the Green New Deal, uh, as macro policy, is viable. We know it's viable. We just did it. We can do it a lot better, but let's learn from what we just did 10 years ago. It works as a short-term stimulus policy, and it can work as a long-term macro policy. We need to be sharper about various things, and maybe the kinds of things that graduate students might want to work on. We need to understand the time lag features of the stimulus program. We need to understand we can't say things are shovel ready, uh, but really, do we know how long they will take? And then you can sequence out the various uh, investment activities. We need to understand the public-private mix better, and yes, we need to understand the financing structures better. But within thinking about financing structures, the overarching idea is this is a self-financed project over time, and that we really just need to get over the initial hump of investing, uh, the, doing the initial capital expenditures. As I said, that's a straightforward proposition when we think about energy efficiency investments. It's also true with renewable energy, because if you look at the cost of delivering renewable energy now, and I can refer you to uh, this, um, this left-wing publication called the US Department of Energy under President Trump, uh, that, uh, they put out every year uh, estimates on the levelized costs of generating electricity from alternative energy sources. Uh, solar and wind are, are at total cost parity with fossil fuel to, to produce electricity much cheaper than nuclear. So uh, that will pay for itself over time. We're at cost parity with renewables, energy efficiency is cheaper, and so we really just need to uh, structure the financing to move this project forward. Thanks. Uh, I'm a historian, uh, I dabble in politics, I know a little bit about uh, European law, EU law. I'm emphatically not an economist. Uh, so I'm in a panel about macro and financial aspects of the Green New Deal. I'm going to say something about the project in which we actually worked together and also with Yanis a couple of years ago called the Ulysses Project that is going to be uh, reborn uh, uh, as we speak for the next year and especially for 2021. Uh, and I, I want to start with a story. My, my first encounter with the New Deal was in the, in the poor neighborhood in Lisbon, Portugal, where I, where, where I grew up. Uh, in my early teens, so this is the 80s, there was a, uh, we used to play soccer in the street and there was an old lady in the street that lived in a, ba in a basement, so her windows were like this at the, at the, the, the ground level. And of course our football would hit her uh, windows all the time. She hated us 
we thought that she was a very, very boring uh, old lady. And one day she crosses me in the street and she asks me, uh, the baker tells me that you speak English. Is that correct? Yes, I do a little bit. So I need you to come over to my house and read some letters that I've received. Turns out that she had been an immigrant here in the United States for decades, uh, spoke very, very few words of English, which uh, uh, it's quite possible she had lived in Newark, which at the time was practically a Portuguese colony. One of my uncles, also a baker, lived there and didn't learn any English. But there were two words that she knew in English, which was social security. So she was not uh, uh, the Hoover Dam or the you know, uh, federal highways, but she was a living monument. She was a daughter of the New Deal. So when I see uh, uh, kids in the, in the Fridays for, for the future, uh, the climate strikes, uh, uh, what I think is that if we get this right, we'll be able, they will be able to say in 30 or 50 years time that they are sons and daughters of the Green New Deal and that we have uh, achieved the ultimate object of political desire, which is to save the planet, have a nice life in the planet, have biodiversity, and have a sustainable human life in the planet. Uh, so in a sense, maybe I fit in this panel because what I want to talk is about what postmodernists, uh, you know, <coughs> derisively called meta-narratives. Meta-narratives, the big stories that we, the grand stories that we tell about ourselves are decisive in politics. So if, if Yeva is correct, or, or the, the author that Yeva quoted that whatever is technological possible is technologically possible is financially feasible, what I think is missing from that picture is that you need to politically unlock it. And you unlock it politically with stories, with narratives. Where we are, where do we come from, where do we go? You know, say whatever you want, but make America great again is a slogan that gives you a story. It gives you this space scale. It's about America. It's not about the world. And gives you the time scale. It's about the past. It's about going back to the time where we were great. It's not about the future. Our counter-narrative needs to be exactly the opposite. It needs to be about the whole world and about the future. Uh, so the Ulysses project was uh, also kind of a narrative. It emerged during the, the Eurozone crisis. Maybe you remember that in, the, in 2009, 2010, uh, countries such as my own uh, and others were called the pigs, the pigs of the Eurozone. It was Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain, and the acronym was pigs. Uh, of course, the acronym, the acronym was dehumanizing for these countries. It helped explain why, uh, after 2010, Germans and, and the Dutch and Finns were not receptive to helping out these countries with cash because they were pigs. <coughs> they were lazy, they, 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 they spent their cash on, on, on uh, uh, <coughs> uh, women and wine as a, as a former Dutch finance minister and Uruguay president once said. And turns out there's an episode in the Odyssey where Ulysses' sailors are transformed into pigs, not by a financial crisis, but by a, 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 sorcerer, a sorceress called Circe. And Ulysses has to turn them back into has to give them back their human form. He gives them back their human form by re-giving them their memory. They had lost their memory. And memory is what makes us human. It's what makes us, uh, uh, memory is at the, base, at the basis of, of, of uh, dialogue, of political imagination, and of human agency. So without memory, we do not have, we are not fully, fully human. Uh, so the Ulysses Project was about uh, redignifying the role of these big countries in the Eurozone. And to redignify this role, their, their role is not just to you know, uh, um, borrow them cash. Even though I felt it was perfectly possible, you could have, as Yanis and James and, and, and uh, um, other friends were saying in the modest proposal, you can raise federal cash, as it were, from the EU, from the European Central Bank, and give, give it directly to the, to, to the countries afflicted by their budgetary crisis. But the crisis of Portugal, Italy, uh, uh, Greece and Spain, set aside Ireland here a little bit, although Ireland is also a Ulysses country because of, of James Joyce and Ulysses the novel. Uh, uh, Ulysses proper was not in Ireland, uh, although he was in Portugal, he founded Lisbon, but uh, it's also a Ulysses country. The problem of these countries is more a problem where do they fit in in the economy of the Eurozone? What are they good for? 
you need to know that in order for you to know that you are worthy of esteem, of self-esteem. So the problem of these countries was mostly a problem of having an economy that was based in low wages, uh, not much complexity in the, in the products that they, that, that they produce, so uh, uh, low added value. So it's more of an economic structure problem than a budgetary problem. Uh, borrowing their the money was, I defended the, the, that, that policy, uh, 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 was important to address budgetary issues, but the problem is that uh, uh, these countries have economic, economic structures that uh, do not make them fit for purpose in the economy of the Eurozone as a whole, and that uh, uh, create a hard job for these countries to find their role in globalization. And it's turning for the worse because, of course, Portugal, for instance, it's the, these three graphs, Portugal is getting older. Uh, uh, um, lots of people are leaving the country, especially the youth and the highly educated youth. Uh, and uh, we are having less people now. And you can see that also in other uh, um, European countries. So here you have the, brain, the map of brain drain in Europe. So there's a clear regional aspect to this. The south and the east migrate. Uh, uh, Central Europe, and at the time this is pre-Brexit, the, the UK received these people, mostly highly educated youth. Uh, um, this map is the map of the most innovative regions in Europe in terms of the economy of innovation, and it's basically more or less the same map. The youth are migrating to uh, where you have more economic innovation. So what do you need? You need to have an agency at the European Union level that focuses on regional aspects of the crisis in Europe, so asymmetrical aspects of the crisis in Europe, and decides, for instance, to build brick and mortar uh, uh, federal universities in, in Southern Europe, where you have cities where everybody would like to live during their degrees, Lisbon, Naples, Athens, uh, Athens uh, and maybe stay there afterwards, and real, uh, uh, renew the economy of these countries, but you need to have money in, in order to do that, or you need to have political packages in order to do that. This is a map of seismic risk in Europe, also something that you can, you can do. You spend lots of money if you rebuild after an earthquake. You have earthquakes in Greece, in Italy. Uh, the, 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 the little spots that you see there in the west is, of course, my hometown, Lisbon that was destroyed by a famous earthquake in 1755. If you spend before the earthquake, you actually spare money because uh, pre-earthquake spending is less, you refit infrastructure, and for each euro that you spend, you are going to spare seven euros because also if you spend <coughs> after the earthquake, the money is very quickly dissipated through corruption, mafia, uh, uh, you know, grabbing the money. I was in the European Parliament when the, when the L'Aquila earthquake in Italy happened. After the earthquake, everybody is shocked, so there was lots of money being disbursed to L'Aquila, but it, it just so happens that the buildings that have been the most affected were the buildings that had been rebuilt after the last earthquake of L'Aquila, 30 years before, where the money had been spent in exactly the same way. And, you know, the um, mafia-linked contractors were using that money to build uh, infrastructure that was not fit for purpose. Uh, this is uh, forest fires in Europe. Also, very clearly, it's an asymmetrical problem in Europe. But then you have probably asymmetrical solutions for Europe as well. This is solar, uh, um, you know, the map of solar power in Europe. So you could very easily have a big project of solar power distribution in Europe where the south exports solar power to the north. And now, in Europe, you usually, people not only ask you, here in the United States, I, I, I get the sense that the question is mostly, where does the money come from? In the EU, the question is usually, do you have a legal basis for that? And the reason is because the EU does not have what German constitutionalists call competence competence, meaning that the EU does not attribute itself new competencies. The EU derives its competencies from the member states that, you know, approve new treaties, rat uh, ratify new treaties, and only then does the European Union have the competence to act in one or another aspect of, you know, of a crisis that they have to face. Uh, this was a problem during the Eurozone crisis. There was a big discussion about, does the EU have a competence to bail out southern countries? And northern countries would say, no, 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 this goes against the treaties. 
big you know, legal question, also about what Mario Draghi could do or not do. There were challenges in the European Court of Justice against quantitative easing by the European Central Bank. But it turns out that fighting climate change is already in the treaties. And actually, it was used during the crisis of the Eurozone. Uh, you may remember that the first Greek bailout had as a legal basis not this article, Article 107 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. That says there, this is about state aid. You know that in Europe, member states are not allowed to uh, uh, directly finance industries, for instance, unless this funding occurs as part of a number of exceptions where then member states can fund uh, directly fund industries. Uh, this is one of the big debates in, in British labor because, yeah, I have to finish. Uh, you know, Corbynites usually say that they cannot nationalize, that they cannot give state aid to British industries, but actually they can. It's a question of law. But here, point B, you know, you can give aid to make good the damage caused by natural disasters or exceptional occurrences. And if Germans complain, it's actually the same article that says in point C that uh, uh, Germany can spend, uh, uh, you know, state aid reintegrating Eastern Germany into Germany. So it's, it is the exact same article that I've used. And in Article 122 that was used for the Greek bailout, you also have where a member state in, is in difficulties or is seriously, seriously threatened with severe difficulties caused by natural disasters or exceptional occurrences beyond its control. <laughs> the council here, the EU can directly fund the member state. It's one exception where you can directly fund a member state. So climate crisis uh, uh, is actually, you have a legal basis to fight climate change. Well, of course, there's a history. It's the history of the Tennessee Valley Authority as a, 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 an energy-based project during the Great Depression to help a region of the United States uh, not only become self-reliant, but also export energy for the rest of the, of the US. Uh, the quote is from the dialogue between Senator Norris and, and Roosevelt about what is the political philosophy behind the Tennessee Valley Authority, and Roosevelt answers. I'll tell them it's neither fish nor fowl, but whatever it is, it will taste awfully good to the people of the Tennessee Valley. <laughs> so, you know, new pragmatism, as Greg Gore was saying. Uh, the US taxpayer, as far as I know, does not spend money in the Tennessee Valley Authority today. On the contrary, the, the, the TVA exports energy and makes money. Uh, and I'll, I'll conclude with just this. Maybe we have to think about the New Deal as something uh, larger, larger than just what happened in the 30s here in the United States. The New Deal is actually the second deal of modernity, being the first was absolutism in the, in the 18th century. It unraveled with the, with the Lisbon earthquake, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. Then you have this New Deal, and that deal was a deal between subject, God, and king. The New Deal is a deal between people, nation, and state. You know, social security. We'll have one dollar from the worker, one dollar from the boss, and we'll you know, create this box where if you are unemployed or if you're ill, you can you know, collect that money back for you to use. It's the national government solving stuff. Now, for the climate crisis, and this you know, goes back to what I said in the beginning, we have to in the left and the progressive side, we have to admit that there is indeed a problem of sovereignty mismatch. The problem is transnational in scale and in substance. It's structurally a, 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 you know, a post-national, a transnational problem. We are not going to solve it by just creating national institutions or national po policy packages or even intergovernmental things like the Paris Agreement. What we have to think about is how to create cosmopolitan institutions that will help carry, uh, transfer the sovereignty of the individual, the agency of the individual, the transnational movements that we are creating in order to solve these problems. It's a little bit like, you know, the fireside chats were still thinking about how to solve problems with stories, with narratives, with meta-narratives, in order to unlock the political potential of a nation and solve the Great Depression. But in the Four Freedom speech, Roosevelt is already thinking about the international level. It's about uh, fear, uh, freedom from fear, from want, everywhere in the world. He always adds after that sen those sentences, everywhere in the world. It's about a global problem. We have now uh, a heated political topic about controversy about nationalism and cosmopolitanism. 
I think that sometimes I see a temptation in the left for us to use the, the old tools of nationalism in order to solve these problems, not realizing that when we are doing so, we are actually, actually strengthening the kind of political scale that will then be used by the far right and the right wing for their reactionary purposes. So we do indeed have to overcome the fear of being, of, you know, uh, assuming our cosmopolitanism, which sometimes is not politically easy in our current context, but people, especially the, 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 the younger than us, they will understand that you only solve this problem through a cosmopolitan at attitude. And that, I think, it's still lacking in our debate of New Deals, even if at the European, which is a transnational level. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you, panel, for um, guiding us to uh, a, a now a, a very attenuated, but going to, it's going to be lively, uh, 10 minutes of questions. Um, Please can you raise your hand if you have a question, and, and please use your time as you would carbon. Uh, and uh, just think about your question in the way that Greta Thunberg thinks about flying. Uh, and so if, if, keep it short, and keep it, you know, if you have to do it at all. But if you do, you have to. OK, Raj. Um, my question is about the, the quote that you mentioned, whatever is technologically possible is financially feasible. But the projects. Um, in the Green New Deal really have to do with a different type of resource, which is a care resource. And so I'm wondering how you figure revaluing or reimagining the value of labor that has to do with care, teaching, you know, um, child care, all of this, health care, um, revaluing that work uh, in, in an economic model for the Green New Deal. Uh, th this question is for Bob, uh, for Bob Poland. Um, Bob, um, in the earlier panel, there was a lot of people talking about the labor movement, and um, I am aware of that. There's a, there was a lot of criticism in the construction labor movement of the retrofit programs, um, and uh, and particularly that the jobs created were not uh, were, were not as they saw them, saw them good jobs. Um, I, I think that's an, an enormously important issue. Uh, and I wonder just your reflections on it, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure that you personally tried your best <laughs> uh, 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 in, that, in that space. Uh, and I think it's just absolutely critical linking this panel to the last one. Uh, we have another, perhaps the, the last question over there. And while, while Lovdy is moving the, the microphone over, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm curious because th this entire panel has shown that we can, in theory and in practice, uh, and even in law, uh, undertake some of the work of the, the, the Green New Deal, but we can't seem to, we're, we're lacking that cosmopolitan politics, we're, we're lacking the narrative. Um, and we're, we're up against uh, the, the way that finance is structured at the moment, particularly fire, uh, you know, finance, insurance, and real estate. How do y'all imagine that transformation, or how do y'all narrate the story of how it is that we get from here through those obstacles, particularly the, the obstacles of finance and of uh, this right-wing politics that's very much articulated to it, to this world of the Green New Deal. And I'll leave, leave the last question to the gentleman there. Sure. Thank you all so much for all your contributions to uh, improving life on Earth for all of us. And along the similar question to Raj is more of a matter of like, you know, looking around the room, there's just a lot of I guess academics and policy people, but very few ordinary people, working people. And so how can we get some of the messages that you all are researching to larger audiences? Of course, social media is one platform and various candidates are trying to really galvanize um, people via that platform. But I'm, I'm really curious for some of you to just talk more very realistically, how can we take these ideas to the masses and to really kind of create the transformation that we all kind of realize we need, but in practice, like, I know a lot of poor people who don't know anything about what we're talking about, and like, but that when they hear about, oh, having a good job and have healthcare, like, they like that. So just how to translate some of this into uh, ordinary language, I guess, for people. Thank you. Um, and we'll, we can just go down the line with, with final, final remarks from... Uh, well, they were aimed questions. But, but uh, so, some of these, I mean, I don't know, Zian, if you, if you want to, to take on how it is that fire might... Uh, well, the, the, the fire is, um, let's call it 20% of the economy in the fire business it used to be less than half of that, and it worked fine. <laughs> Finance worked great 30 years ago. It certainly doesn't perform better, whatever measure you want, because nobody's got an output measure. 
Um, so um, it's flab at best. And you wonder why people feel they're not getting anything in this economy. Well, first, from there, there's nothing much to get. So you take a good, I'd say, dozen percent of your economy and say, you know, this provides no value to people. It's price without value. Um, you know, then you can have your own opinion on the uh, other, five, let's call it five, that goes to the Pentagon, and you've got, you're beginning to get some um, things. So that, that seems like a place for reduction, enormous reduction. That said, what I hear in this room is a much greater concern with, let's say, the New Deal aspect. And a acceptance, maybe simply taking it as a starting point of the green aspect. And I, I really feel, I, I quite agree with the importance of all these New Deal concerns. As I said earlier, in part to enable the green, but also by themselves. However, I think the real problem we face is the analogy with the war economy. We don't have the mobilization. The war economy has a mobilization, massive. So you, you're not, you are taxing, you know, giving them ration tickets. Um, you're, you're constraining consumption. You can use all kinds of devices. Jamie will tell you about rationing. Uh, and allocation. Um, but you had the mobilization in order to do that. Um, and I don't think the problem was the war is now. This damn thing, which is the total war, the total wipeout, it, it, tomorrow will be okay. There's right. it, it, not going to be any big difference tomorrow or even the next day. So you've got, and a lot of people find it much easier not to contemplate something truly horrific. Because anyone with any sense has learned to reject these end of the world stories. However convincing they may be on the first hearing, you know it's not right. <laughs> Never has been. So the problem becomes there, and then the mobilization permits the rest. So that's if we're having a green New Deal. If we're having a New Deal, which is a perfectly good thing to have, we can use it. Maybe it can push the mobilization a bit. I don't know. Um, Easy. <clears throat> well, uh, in the paper that I mentioned, we argue that we need to treat climate change as the moral equivalent of a war. How successful we are in building the narrative in that way that this is what it really is, that's uh, you know, that's up, up, up for debate. Um, but I want to just address the question of care um, and how we revalue it. And so the job guarantee that we, uh, uh, we propose and that modern money theory has been proposing for a long time has a major care work component to it. So the Levy Institute, for example, had a job guarantee proposal that they evaluated, you know, the economic impacts of, and that was a $15 an hour benefits, you know, health care, child care benefits, so the workers would get uh, all of those benefits in the, the job guarantee workers, and a lot of that was care work. So we are basically dividing our job guarantee pool, and we're saying half of it will be for greening the economy, the other half would be care work, right? And then they would be paid this $15 an hour or whatever the living wage needs to be, because for some places that's not a living wage, right, for some of the urban areas. Um, and, uh, and, and so that's, I, I guess I would say, if you pay them more, that's one way to revalue care work, right? And because it's been traditionally done by women, that's one of the reasons why it has not been valued. And so uh, there's definitely a way to go there. Uh, and, and that's related to the question of quality of jobs, right? That you, you, know, you need to make sure that the jobs you create are of good quality. Uh, and so you know, if you have a Medicare for all and then you provide child care and other kinds of benefits, uh, then I guess that is improving quality of jobs. So that's why, you know, you have all these issues, but you need to try to solve them with a big, like, integrated package because they're, they are related, right? Uh, they are related issues. 
Um, the question of finance is actually an interesting one, and it dovetails with what I was uh, saying here, in that if you're trying to find sources of resources, so industries that you can try to shrink, which will release resources for a Green New Deal, well, finance is a very good candidate for that, right? So, and that will be helping with a narrative in that finance is not very popular, so you could say, well, how do we pay for it? We shrink the financial sector, and that's how we pay for a Green New Deal, and I think that would go a long way. But I, I, I just want to say that Overall, I think it would help the narrative very much if we can decouple taxes from spending, and probably Bob would disagree with me on this one, right? Uh, that we need to structure the finance. I think that's usually the argument, but we need to de decouple taxing and spending, right? Because uh, every pro program that go has to go through Congress, you know, how do we do you pay for it? Like the pay for is an it becomes an important issue, except that only uh, the progressive policies are. Uh, you know, subject to that past, it seems like the, the other things like, you you know, uh, spending for the military or tax cuts, those things are not subject <coughs> to the same kind of logic. So we need to move away from this pay for mentality. Uh, I would say modern money theory, so the question of how do you take it to larger audiences has a very big following, uh, a sort of grassroots following, I would say, and they've done a, a very good job of trying to take the message to uh, the average, you know, American. Um, so, and, Thank and, you. and I would say that, that, that has helped when I was in graduate school in 2006, 2007, the job guarantee, I never thought that I would see that, you know, sort of thrown into the national discourse, and, and here it is, it's, it's there. So. Thank you. Uh, in the minute we have left, David, Bob, and Rui, um, do, do you feel like pitching in or? Yeah, just, just I'm, I'm excited to, to dig more in the course of the day and tomorrow morning about the politics of this. The one comment I would want to, I would want to make is that, you know, it's been interesting to look at the party systems. On the one hand, the United States is a very, it's a kind of a traumatizing party system in the sense that one of these two parties is a climate denying party. <coughs> but on the other hand, that's actually a hidden blessing because it was what's happening is that it's forcing the Democratic Party to put together uh, a coalition inside of its party of people who are concerned about the New Deal aspects, people who are concerned about the green aspects. What's happening in Europe, to go back to the premise in my presentation, is that there's a split, a neat split that falls along uh, the, the nice sort of demographic split between younger millennials who are marching in Fridays for Future, who care about climate, uh, and the people who care about the lack of investment in jobs, uh, namely working communities, frontline communities who care about the economic side, the New Deal side. And what's happening now is this very dangerous thing that's happening because green parties who represent that urban cosmopolitan precariat care much more about the green side and the classic far right and far left factions are more concerned about taking care of an urban, uh, more rural, wider uh, proletariat. And it's precisely up to us to, to marry, especially in Europe, to marry those two sides, to insist that you cannot have a green transition that's not also linked to social justice, we talked about in the last panel. Um, and so to plug my report, we'll be coming out with the next edition of this blueprint for Europe's just transition with what we call pathways to a Green New Deal for Europe about actually how you make these policies come off the page and into the streets. I don't want to sell it short. I mean, you talked about a mobilization is the last thing I'll say. Seven million young people on the streets of Europe marching in the name of uh, addressing the climate crisis. That's something closer to a mobilization than, than, than we might, I mean. We've had some nice shows, yeah. Nice shows, yeah, so definitely you know, some nice shows. we in, in the States too. Right, yeah, yeah, but I agree, it's not, a, it's not a war mobilization. But you know, maybe, yeah, I, I don't disagree. But there's something to build on there, and the question is how do we create the coalition between those youngsters who are interested in decarbonization with people who are serious about delivering good jobs for, uh, for poor people? In my remaining 12 seconds, uh, <laughs> I'll just respond quickly. There's a lot we could talk about on some of these other issues, but um, very well taken point, Damon, on the, um, the retrofit program, which gets to what I was talking about in that the retrofit program was the most successful because it was the easiest to do. It was the closest thing to something like Shovel Ready. And then by two, uh, two years later, the program was over, and you know we were waiting for the private investments to do the the construction and manufacturing. It ended up you know like waiting for Godot. Uh, it didn't happen. So the the good jobs uh, didn't come along as fast as the low paying entry level um, uh, retrofitting jobs. Um, you know the general problem, and I, I've studied this in a bunch of uh, papers and so forth. If we want to take a broad average, yeah, the fossil fuel jobs on average are paying you know, $90,000, $100,000 a year. These are good jobs. 
and that's why people want to keep them. Uh, if you take on average the kind of jobs that will get created through green investments, we're looking at 20, 30 percent less on average, and that's, that's a reality. Now, those jobs are pretty good for people that don't have jobs, uh, but they're not going to be comparable on average to the pay that people now get in, in the fossil fuel industry, and that therefore that's you know even further argument as to why the just transition for people in fossil fuels and their communities to be an absolutely central feature of the overall project. Okay, I'm going to use the same 12 seconds and <laughs> add a little bit because English is not my mother tongue. Uh, well, I think that we, we, we need the imagination of the war without, <coughs> without the war itself. That goes without saying. So maybe we need to think beyond the war. Uh, maybe we need to think about our uh, about other revolutionary historic uh, uh, eras, such as the Enlightenment or the Renaissance, that actually coincide also with periods of great technological and communicational change, like the printing press, the invention of the printing press, or uh, mass media, uh, uh, newspapers, gazettes, and books, uh, which is which correlates, I think, more with our with our uh, own period. I think that Europe is actually, I, I, I share David's you know, pessimistic view of, of, of the Brussels circle. But Europe is actually a very interesting, uh, one could argue that Europe is a place where this can get solved or start to get solved because it is already a transnational polity. Europe is not the United Nations, it's not an, just purely the EU is not an international organization, but it's also not a country. But in many ways, the EU is more integrated than many countries. Economically, maybe more integrated than Brazil or India. Uh, culturally, we have the correlates of, our, of, my, of the old lady in my street in the youth that uh, does the Erasmus project, you know, the interchange, student interchange project in Europe. They call themselves the sons and daughters of the Erasmus program, uh, uh, where they go to other countries, marry with people of other countries. There's apparently more than one million babies that are called the Erasmus <laughs> babies. And you know where that throws back to is to Erasmus's of Rotterdam, Erasmus of Rotterdam's time, which was the 16th century, where they were starting to think about redistribution and migration. There's a, actually a dialogue in one of Erasmus's books where two beggars are talking about begging in, in the Netherlands, and one says, now they do not allow me to go from Rotterdam to Leiden because they have subsidies for the poor in Leiden, and they have discovered that if they give subsidies to the poor in Leiden, everybody is going to go from the rest of the Netherlands to, to Leiden. So they were already thinking that if you have freedom of circulation, as you have in the EU, you need to have redistribution at the same scale. Uh, so maybe we need to go back to these to this, uh, times, think about what is the revolutionary technological change in communication that is, you know, just around the corner that we could use, <laughs> since YouTube and Twitter and Facebook are already you know, owned by large corporations that are uh, uh, in thrall of the far right or are being used by the far right. I was talking to Rebecca about this a crazy <laughs> idea. Maybe virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, immersive reality, that, that, that could be interesting. We could try to use those tools to do what we did with the Ulysses documentary. If you look for Ulysses breaking the spell of the crisis, you, you see a documentary where James participates about overcoming the, the European crisis. Um, and say that what we need, the new deal that we use, it's a new deal between humanity, nature, and technology. That, that makes sense to a different constituency of people than what the Make America Great Again uh, uh, um, you know, uh, argument makes sense. But, <laughs> that we need a new deal between humanity, nature, and technology is, I think, a winning argument. It can make sense to an increasingly large, larger uh, constituency, to whom then we can say, we just need to tax what is owed. The EU loses, maybe tomorrow's panel is going to address this, already 1 trillion euros every year in tax evasion. For you to have an idea, one trillion euros, it's the budget of the whole EU for 10 years, not for one year or two or three. You know, the budget of the EU is around 100 billion every year. It's really, really small, a small budget. But if you tax what is owed in tax evasion every year in the EU, you have the money for the Green New Deal, even without, you know, entering in the minutia of, you know, uh, 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 
uh, macroeconomic doctrines. The, the, the money is there. If you say it's to create a new deal, it's to save the planet, to create a new deal between humanity, nature, and technology, people will say, go for that money. It's there. We should use it. And with that call for revolutionary action, uh, I'd like to uh, 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 ask you to thank the panelists. And we're now moving to our, key, our first keynote speaker in, uh, in, in the lunch area over there. But thank you very much indeed. Hi, welcome back. So what did you think? Any comments you have, any questions you have, please let us know. Let's have this discussion. Let's build a bigger movement, a more inclusive movement, but one that's based on economic realities so that we don't have pie in the sky ideas, that we actually are grounded in reality. It's just that that reality is abundant. We have abundant resources to be able to solve the problems that we have, including climate change and health care and social inequalities and social injustices. We can do all those things. There is a path forward, but there is no path forward if we don't understand how to financially afford them. It's not enough to simply define the individual problems if you think that solving them is economically infeasible. MMT shows us that that part is a lie. Whatever problems we have, we can finance the solutions. So let's have a conversation with an understanding that we can move forward. We can solve these problems. Join us. See you next week. <laughs>